In this segment, we're gonna talk about how to take word embeddings and actually apply them in uh, a basic neural net architecture for NLP, the deep averaging network. So the, typically the way that embeddings get used is in the first layer of the network. The first step we do is we take uh, our indices of words, essentially, we've, we've uh, kind of mapped them into our vocabulary, and then we embed those words. We, uh, we use our embeddings to convert them into vectors. So there's actually a few different ways to do this. The first is that we uh, learn these embeddings as parameters from our data, meaning we don't use any kind of pre-trained or vectors that are learned over the web. Uh, instead, we just randomly initialize all of them and learn them with backpropagation. And this actually can work reasonably well. Um, if you have enough data in your, uh, in your data set, you can learn the important relationships between words purely from the data without uh, needing to appeal to this kind of external resource. Of course, what it can't do is let you deal with words that aren't seen in your training set uh, and things like that. So the second approach is to initialize these word embeddings with glove and then keep them fixed, meaning that we uh, take glove vectors, and I mean, again, you can use any of the techniques here, continuous bag of words, skip gram, whatever. You take those vectors, uh, your first layer of the network just looks up that glove embedding um, and then sticks it into whatever's gonna happen from there. And so this is, uh, th this is sort of slightly more efficient from a training perspective because we don't need to update the, uh, we don't need to update the word embedding layer at all. Um, but of course it's a little bit inflexible. If the glove objective doesn't actually learn exactly the right structure in the vector space for whatever task you have, um, it's not necessarily gonna work great. And this is true for sentiment, where uh, a kind of famous problem with embeddings is that antonyms, like good and bad, often end up kind of closer than you would want because they can occur with a lot of the same words, like you know, good food, bad food, right? Both of those show up. So the third technique uh, is to initialize with glove, but then additionally fine tune the embeddings during learning, meaning uh, kind of back propagate your gradients into this embedding layer as well. Uh, and whether this works better than approach two or approach one, like this really depends on the task and the specifics of the amount of data that you have. Um, but for tasks like sentiment, this is often the, the most standard way to do it. We can, so when we think about applying these word embeddings, we can think about evaluating them uh, intrinsically, so-called, on tasks like word similarity, meaning we just look at the embeddings and say, okay, how good is this embedding for as sort of for embedding's sake? This is not typically how we're gonna think about embeddings. Um, typically what we wanna do with embeddings and then also with pre-trained models like Elmo and BERT is do kind of real downstream tasks. Uh, like sentiment analysis, for example. So we're not going to think about taking, uh, you know, the, so much about these intrinsic evaluations, but instead we're going to think about which embeddings are best from the perspective of when we plug them into these downstream tasks, what works best. All right, so let's talk a about a method for actually plugging them in. So this is a relatively simple technique for sentiment that works surprisingly well. Um, it's a network called the Deep Averaging Network due to Mohit Iyer et al. And the idea is quite simple. It's a feed-forward neural network based on an average of the word embeddings from the input. So we have uh, an input predator as a masterpiece. Uh, each word has an embedding, um, you know, using one of the approaches from the previous slide. And we average those, uh, just straight up arithmetic mean, and then we pass those through one or more layers of a feedforward network and then use a softmax to actually make our prediction. So the, the, the kind of key thing is that the feedforward network here can learn um, you know, fairly sophisticated interactions between the different components of this uh, green vector here. However, what it cannot do is learn about complex relationships between the different words in the input. So at the time that this came out, there was a widely held view that we need to model the syntactic structure in order to uh, represent 
you know, and, and solve this kind of sentiment task effectively. People were building networks that looked like this on the right, where we have this compositional structure to it where it builds up uh, a representation of the sentence following a syntactic parse tree, which we're going to come to a little bit later in the course. But what it turned out was that at least in 2015, the simple averaging technique can work as well as this kind of syntactic composition for uh, these problems. And I think really what this showed is not that syntax is useless, but that at the time, these methods were not actually really leveraging it and were not doing more than uh, this more basic approach can do. Um, so if we look at the uh, kind of results on this from, from this model, uh, the deep averaging network here. Um, no, so this was actually not using pre-trained embeddings at all. So it was approach one uh, from the first slide. And this was uh, outperforming some of these very strong bag of words methods sometimes. And it was also, you know, about on par with these tree structured neural networks, which had seen a lot of a lot of work in this, uh, in particular, this convolutional neural network uh, approach from uh, Kim in 2014, um, we see that the results are sort of roughly in the same ballpark. And so this indicates that, like you know, in fact, a lot of these techniques that were either building up a tree structure or using ComNets weren't actually achieving much better composition uh, than just simply averaging these vectors together. So we could take a look at what this method is, is kind of unable to do, and you know maybe this, this will then surprise us to how good these results are. Um, so we have here a few examples and we have that, that are all uh, ground truth positive, and the deep averaging networks predictions and this uh, deep recurrent neural networks predictions, which uses this tree structured composition. We see that for all of these examples, the deep averaging network, uh, or the deep averaging network, should be predicting positive, and it gets positive for the first one, um, which kind of makes sense given that there's you know a fair amount of of sort of positive stuff in here. But then for the next two, it predicts negative. It's not able to uh, you know it's not able to deal with this kind of mix of positive and negative things and appropriately judge how these things combine in the final assessment. And we can look at uh, a, a kind of more targeted case here. Um, the movie was not good, good, bad, not bad. And uh, it's not able to correctly learn this structure either. Basically, not and bad both end up meaning negative. And so it predicts negative three in three out of four cases, which is not correct. Um, so we'll come back to the ideas of compositionality once we get to syn syntax uh, and start talking about tree structures. And also when we talk about uh, recurrent neural networks and long short-term memory models or LSTMs. Um, but for now, this is a, you know, this is at least one way of taking the word embeddings we have so far, making predictions, uh, and it works in, I would say, surprisingly well for this task. And that's the end of this segment.